Welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, being here at the PASS Summit on the last day in the afternoon. I know everybody's tired. I know I am. Um, but once again, thank you. This session I put together after about a year ago being asked by my company to figure out if it makes sense for us to move some of our stuff into the cloud or not. And it, as always, you think that's an easy task, but then it took me almost a year uh, to figure out how to read all this and figure out how to calculate it and compare it. And then I thought that's probably a good idea to share with the community, which I did in the past. I get paid to have fun, and then I'll share the learnings from there. So my name is Thomas Grosser. I'm a 10-year data platform MVP. When I started doing this stuff, it was still called SQL Server MVP. Now we are more diverse in the platforms we use. And I'm with SQL Server for a very long time. So, but let's go through the requirement slides. Please, if you have a cell phone, uh, turn it off. Pass is doing a lot of other activities. I know I'm contributing to the virtual groups. I do SQL Saturdays, I organize one. Uh, I volunteer wherever I can. I invite you to do the same, both from the learning side and from the sharing your knowledge that you gain over time. I was, 15 years ago, I was sitting right there and listening to someone else up here, learning my stuff, and now it's time to give back. That's me. Uh, the bottom half of the slide tells you I'm old, uh, <laughs> and I'm doing this way too long. The top says, yeah, I get paid to build infrastructure for SQL Server and uh, give SQL Server a very good environment to run it. Yeah, so this is. So after the session, please go to the uh, PASS Summit website, fill out the email forms. That's the only way we speakers learn if we do something wrong or if we can improve or if you want us to do something different. Yeah, please don't blame me for the food. Last year, I got a very bad score from one person that said they didn't like the chicken. Uh, I wish I could have changed that, but I can't. Uh, the problem is, passes AI doesn't realize that's not about my talk, so they gave me a hard time about it. Um, yeah. So today, I have to create a little bit put everybody on the same page. So we're gonna talk a little bit about different workloads, what actually you have to look for in a service level agreement so that you have the foundation to actually compare things. Um, and then the third one is how to figure out what the limits are because sometimes it's not just about the cost, sometimes it's about can that other infrastructure actually do what I need, thing is. Then we're going to go through the technical decision factors that can help you decide where to go. Then we go to the other factors, uh, which are mainly known as the manager told me something. Um, and the last part, which is the one I did not in the 24 hours of pass, I saved for here, is um, a little bit a look in how in this insanely maze of pricing information that is on the cloud websites and your favorite hardware vendor has, how you have a fighting chance of actually figuring out what's going on. So, but up front, I thought I'll give you the answer up front to the main question. Should you put your stuff in your own data center, in the cloud, or do a mix? And it's super simple to answer with two words. <laughs> uh, we, we've all heard. The product should be called It Depends instead of SQL Server. That would make it so different, so much easier. No, realistically. So we have to look at workloads. How much work do we have to do? Yeah? And it starts very early and it never changes. And yes, that could actually be a picture of my desk, but it's not. Um, every workload is different. Unless you're using the same third-party software, then two of you have, might have the same workload, but not even then, because it might be different. One might use it with 10 users, the other one with 50 users. But I've 
for 25 years worked in all kinds of industries, company sizes, everything around it, and the requirements are different everywhere. So there's no one size, one shoe fits all. It's just not possible. So when looking at can I move something, I have to understand what I'm actually moving. And once you reach a certain, the smaller you are, the easier it is to be familiar with each one of your systems. Once you get bigger, uh, it becomes more of a task that you have an average knowledge of what's going on in the environment till you reach a size where everything's purely statistics. Yeah? So I've worked in environments where we had literally like three databases. And I worked in, right now I work in an environment where we have 21,000 databases. Um, and if you heard the keynotes, I'm not that far away from <laughs> how much the whole cloud has with 21,000. Yeah? And by the way, we create about 200 new ones a week. So it's going to go up. So when I started in IT, only the very first column was available. Now it's called traditional, meaning I'm old. Uh, the whole stack, starting from the data center, which is basically, you need a building, you need power, uh, you need cooling, network, storage, servers, virtualization, operating system, database, the application, the data itself. Yeah? This is the whole stack, and this is very common, I guess. Then someone said, hey, most people don't want to build their own data center because we are not a construction company. We are something else. So the first wave happened that people stopped building their own data center, but companies came up and says, hey, here's a data center, there's a power cable, do whatever you want. We cool the room, we, we put air conditioning, uh, fire suppression in it, we make it happen. Yeah. The next one is then some of these says, hey, we even give you the network, the cabinets, everything else, because they find, hey, we can make more money and make your life easier. That was called uh, hosting. Thing is, yeah, and that's still very common today. Yeah, uh, and basically, if you use the cloud in the way that you just fire up a VM, it's not much different. Yeah, it's just you get it in a virtualized way. In the early days, you called up Rackspace, and they actually gave you a server, physical box, and you used it. Now everybody just gives you a virtual machine. But we're also seeing the trend going back. Most of the cloud providers now have something reserved instances, dedicated instances. I saw in Amazon's list now there's bare metal options where you get it without an operating system on it. Yeah? So it all comes full circle. Yeah? And cloud computing, I'm old enough, we did it already. We called it outsourcing. <laughs> yeah? And it didn't go well. Let's see how round two goes. Um, I guess, yeah? And then People said, hey, we also manage the operating system for you. We manage your database inform for you. This is managed instances, uh, SQL database, uh, RDS on Amazon. I try to be as cloud provider neutral. Every time I mention one of them by name, just imagine in your head all the others are as good at, or as bad as the one I mentioned. Yes, yeah. uh, and then, of course, and that's a very good thing, is applications. Yeah. Uh, I worked for, two diff for three different companies in the United States, and in all three companies, we used the same HR website. It's the same program. We just go there. I knew exactly how to get my vacation days because it's the same way in the previous company. This is the last column, software as a service. Yeah? So we have traditional, co-location, hosting, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. There's even now things that is data as a service. It's not just we give you the offer, we also provide you the data. Yeah. A friend of mine is doing it for 20 years. <laughs> they provide data to retail companies so they can print the nice little labels in the supermarket that explains uh, what's on the shelf. Yeah. Uh, but that's becoming more and more that companies just sell the data that you need. In the past, you had to consume it yourself. Good. So this talk is focusing A on databases because it's still past summit um, and server and network. Yeah? So 
We're not going to focus on different operating systems and all. And the main reason is we only have about an hour to do so. Yeah? If we had 10 hours or 15 hours, we could look at each one of these levels. But I focus on this one. Why? That's the one I'm most comfortable from. This means I can answer the most questions and I will give you the most accurate information. So, the first super quick step that I found out over time is that you can probably make a decision if going to the cloud is a good idea for you or not based on your company size. Yeah? And I don't think it's very surprising what I'm going to tell you. So I did two rankings. One is based on how many employees you have, and the other one is about how much of these employees are working in IT, yeah? because it's very different. I worked for a company many years ago. We had about 300 employees, and 250 of them were IT. Yeah? That's an unusual ratio. <laughs> yeah? uh, I worked in companies where they had 10,000 employees, and maybe 50 were IT. That's also an unusual ratio. Yeah? Right now, we are about 1,200 people and about 500 are IT. Still high, but uh, more what you see in these days. So small companies, less than 10 people, or one IT person, which usually is not voluntarily doing this job, it just assigned, or it's the son of someone that knows a little bit about computer games and therefore becomes the head of IT. Um, no, it, it's just, I like to call it the mom and pop shop that is not building the business around technology. They need some technology because even if you are a small pizza shop today, you need a website to sell the pizza because people just expect it to be there today. Yeah? And then you have the medium company with about 100 or 10 people in IT, and then it's larger with 1,000 and 100, and you see a very simple pattern. Yeah? I, I tried to come up with awesome numbers, that, but ended up, it's just a size. Yeah? And nothing of this is set in stone. As I said, you can have an enterprise with more than 10,000 people, more than 1,000 people in IT. It's all possible. Yeah? And then you will always have edge cases. Uh, the other thing is, yeah? the smaller you are, the more cloud points you get. Yeah? There, there's no point for a pizza shop to run a data center, unless you're Pizza Hut. Yeah? Then you might think that's a good idea. But even for Pizza Hut, it might not be. Because compared to the size of their total business, they might have a much, much smaller portion of how much they actually is. Yeah? But I don't know. I have a friend that works for Subway. They have a definite need for databases. <laughs> Amazing how many sandwiches you have to count in a database every day. Yeah? In a medium company, you might start thinking about it. But that's mostly today the case, and this is why I gave it one data center point and less cloud points, is you probably already did because you're in business for 10 years, so you already built something. Yeah? And that might prevent you from just, let's throw it away and do everything new. You might slowly transition into it. Yeah? I could fully see a medium-sized company run everything in the cloud much more efficient and much more cost-effective than doing it uh, themselves. Because again, that company is most likely not doing their core business. If it's a company that, that sole purpose is to uh, stream something on the internet or have the next awesome game, that's a different story. That's an IT company that needs one or two other employees. Yeah? But if you're a regular business that has a little bit of computing, this is still probably a good way to go there. Yeah? The larger the company gets, it's very simple, the more things. But even a large enterprise that probably owns properties all over the world yeah, has already built data centers in the last 30, 50 years of operations, they still have cases where it totally makes sense to do some part in the cloud. Yeah? But just take everything and put it there makes no sense at all. Um, everything I hear that, like, we have this project, we're going to move everything to the cloud. I'm like, good luck. Uh, that's not going to be 
very successful. If they have a plan, okay, everything new we develop, we do it cloud style. We use cloud technology to do it. And we have this 10, 15 year transition plan that piece by piece we're gonna make small. And then we reach a size where we're small enough where it makes no sense to maintain it on site anymore and we move it. That makes sense. And to be very clear, there will be edge cases where none of this above matters and everything needs to go to the cloud. And there will be edge cases where everything above doesn't matter, everything has to stay on site. And this can be one of a gazillion reasons. Uh, and I will give a few more examples of what classifies as one of these edge cases and could help you argue one or the other way. Yeah? But I stick to my first two words, it depends. There is, I cannot give you an answer. Thing is, I can help you when you email me afterwards, you describe me your case that we could or have a quick conversation in the hallway. I'm happy to give you my opinion on it, but without knowing what you're actually doing, it's really hard. But let's see other criteria I can list you. And this will help you to compile like a one or two page pro con list, what makes sense for us and what not. Yeah? Database workloads, OLTP, small, a few transactions per minute, yeah? regular, a few transactions per second. Yeah, large, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. Yeah, so everything from small to large. And then extremes, millions of transactions per second. This is where I work. Um, and then on the other side, again, edge cases. They will always exist. And the same exists if you have a data warehouse. Yeah? You have a small, a couple of gigabytes, regular one, which these days is terabytes. When I started a data warehouse that was a gigabyte, people were like, wow. Yeah? Uh, these days, when you say my terabyte is a, my data warehouse is a terabyte, everybody's like, yeah, okay. Uh, if you tell them I have a petabyte, that's a different story. Yeah. Good. And again, cloud points. The smaller your workload is, the more sense it might make to the cloud. Why? Because in the cloud, you can get a fraction of an infrastructure. You don't have to buy. The problem is if you put your own server somewhere, that might be by itself cheaper than getting a VM in a cloud provider, but you need network infrastructure, you need an uplink to the internet, you need air conditioning, you need monitoring, you need blah, 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 100,000 things that you have to build around it. And thing is, also, thing is, in the world I work, we, we try to, how can we spread workload across multiple physical big boxes? Uh, uh, in many other places is, hey, can we consolidate these 10 servers into a single one because none of them is actually doing something? When you're working on a project like this, you can easily go uh, into direction of the cloud. And as before, the more larger you get, the more likely you will be having a success story on-prem um, than you have the successor in the cloud. And again, with edge cases, it could get fifth either way again. There's no, there's, there's never a guarantee. Yeah? Uh, I've seen very successful implementations, like my friend of the sandwich shop, they're using SQL Data Warehouse because they turn it off all day long. So during the day, they run it as the smallest instance possible and then at midnight, they turn it on to the largest possible instance. Then they suck in 30,000 subsidiaries, the data that they collected all day, which takes a couple of minutes because they now have a very beefy large data warehouse that costs hundreds of dollars per hour. They run all the reporting they need. Once the reports are done, they make it small again and let it sleep all day because during the day, nobody wants it. They just have standardized things. If for any reason they need to find out new information, they spin it up for that one day, run it one day, but leave it alone the rest. But they're not changing that often, so for them, that's a very good solution. Because on-prem, they would have had to pay for the whole infrastructure, and it would run all day long and only be used half a day. The nice thing about the cloud is you can turn things off. And the more you turn them off, the thing is, 
We have an application, we need exactly three days a month at the end of the month, and then we don't need it for the rest of the following month, and then three days again. Perfect candidate. You run something 24 seven, it still depends. If it's the only thing you have, it might make sense. If it's one of 100,000 other things you already have in your data center, it might make more sense to keep it there. Splitting the workload. That's another thing that is now a possibility. Before there was the cloud, you had it in your place, but there was no option to put it somewhere else, except you participated in the outsourcing thing. Uh, but in-house or in the cloud. You can run production, DR, and development in in-house, on the ground, as I learned this week, we call it. I will change that in the future. Um, that makes sense. And you run nothing in the cloud. Okay, that's an option. But you can say, hey, we move our development there. Why? Because developers constantly want to try something, and our IT department gets crazy if they get 15 requests per day to provide something for a week and then go away. Perfect candidate for the cloud. Yeah? You spin something up, you try something, you hopefully don't forget to turn it off again. If not, you will be reminded at the end of the month, uh, <laughs> uh, or someone else will do. I guess, yeah? Another one is you have production and development in-house, and you say DR. If you have a system where DR is not that important. I once helped a company that was a pharmaceutical company, and the IT boss says, hey, we do a survey what actually happens if we can't operate IT. So he gave them the scenario, what would, how would, and every employee in the company had to fill it out. So the question was, what would you do if you have no IT for two hours, half a day, one day, two days, a week, or a month? And it turned out, up to three days, nobody in the company had actually a problem with not having IT. I'm not sure if this 10 years later today is still the case, but back then everybody was surprised because everybody thought everything's gonna come to a standstill if IT is not working. But no, the simplest answer that came back from most of the people is when it was a couple of hours, they said, yeah, finally I have time to clean up my desk for once in a while, or I'll, I find a meeting that I have to go to or something. With two or three days, they says, yeah, I'll take a day off. But None of the work was that important. Yeah? You ask a different company, then I worked for an online company that had a website 24 seven. You ask them, can we turn it off for three microseconds? And the answer was no. <laughs> yeah? So as always, it depends. But with DR, if you can design your DR that it practically doesn't run, so you just ship the data there and have everything ready to go if you need it, that's a perfect case. Yeah? If, you, if it has to run full size like your production environment, then it will cost you probably a lot, but that's a thing you can do. So, next one, production, in-house, everything else in the cloud, another option. Why not, thing is, and then of course, nothing in-house and everything in the cloud. Um, and all these variations exist, and this is where it becomes so hard to start giving actual advice. Because we've now seen how much of IT do we have, which kind do we have, and how do we want to spin it. And this is just the first things that popped in my mind. When I did this assessment for the company I work for, I had like, over the year, we came up with like 10, 15 more really important stuff. And then you might focus on something small. Yeah. Yes. And this, at the bottom one is, that's an excellent one we found. So what we're doing is we have what we call this compute grid. It's a lot of CPUs that calculate something awesome. I don't understand it. I'm about three or four PhDs short of understanding what these things are doing. Uh, but they hit databases really hard around the clock. Yeah. So this is running all day, all night, every day, yeah? Can be turned off for a couple of minutes, but it has to run. But sometimes they want to do more. So they're, already at a, they're always at 100% in-house, yeah? And they know it. Okay, I schedule my task. Sometimes it takes five minutes, sometimes it takes an hour till it's done. But sometimes something really important comes up, 
Yeah, like end of quarter earning reports from various companies. We need to do more analysis. And that's where we came up with the idea. Hey, we have our own compute grid that is very well utilized and makes no sense to move it to the cloud because we already have it. We paid for it. Uh, why throw it away? But we placed our data center strategically close to a cloud data center, so we had very low latency. And a couple of times, we spun up 50,000 cores in the data center for three hours. It did all the calculations that our own hardware couldn't do in that time frame. And afterwards, we turned it off. And then we got a couple of thousand dollar bill from the cloud provider. That made sense. So that's also an option you have. Yeah? Do normal in home. Another friend of mine works for a job site, job finding site. Yeah? Funny, fun fact, their business is about 10 times as high as on the yearly average on January 1st. With all the New Year's revolution, I need a better job. And suddenly their web servers explode. Yeah? They were one of the very first ones to go to the cloud. Yes, all year long they run it on their own site with one or two web servers and everybody's happy. And then on January 1st, they spin up another 50 in the cloud, and still everybody's happy on January 2, they turn it off and over. And the same thing goes for many other industries. Yeah? You, you are a movie theater chain. Yeah? Star Wars comes out. Tickets go on sale. Yeah? Two options. You have a data center that's big enough to handle that case, or these are the perfect workloads. And there was one in the keynote, HR block. Yeah? Yeah. Nobody thinks about taxes unless it's April 14th. <laughs> yeah? And then everybody wants them done in one day. Yeah? So, same thing. Or another fun one that I saw, not doing it myself, is the reverse. You do production in the cloud, but you use your old hardware that needs refreshing for DR. Good enough for DR. Yeah? So that's another case where you can utilize what you have in a clever way. So. The next one is, that's the hard one, the service level agreement. And as usual, I have some funny pictures to begin with. Um, when you decide to put stuff out of your own hands, you need to have a written way of knowing what's happening if something goes wrong. Yeah? Within your company, it's very simple. The CEO says so, that's what gets done. Yeah, your boss says, that's what gets done. So there's, you can still communicate. When you hand anything to an external company, there is a call center between you and the other side. And these people get just paid to not let you through. <laughs> that's, that's, they block, yeah, because, and imagine, yes, if, if you are consuming something that an external company manages for you and something goes wrong with the part that you use, and that's the only thing that goes wrong, you call them, someone will pick up, they will help you, and usually within a couple of hours, you can expect a solution. If your company is used to, we have a problem, someone gets woken up and within 15 minutes they fix the problem, that will not happen in the cloud. When you design your software correctly in the cloud, it doesn't matter because something failing, it, something else will take over automatically. But if you just do lift and shift, that's not the case. You expect the same SLA, but the cloud will never give you that. It's not designed to do that. In-house, you have like 15 measurements of how things are changed. In the cloud, that's very different. Yeah? If in the, a server in the cloud dies, you just get moved to the next one, and that takes 10, 15 minutes. That's great. In-house, you might have had a different way of handling uh, an, an HA event. Yeah? If you still need that, you need this. And the service level agreement, you need to know. And just so you can tell your higher-ups that if we have an outage and it's not affecting just us, it might take six, eight hours. And then, yes, we get $15 compensation at the end of the month for it, uh, but that's pretty much it. You can fire the cloud provider, but then our data is gone. Uh, but it's a different way of working, and you need to understand what you have to expect in a worst case scenario. And this is what service level agreements are for. Yeah. So things like availability. How much downtime can you tolerate and how much do you can give you? Yeah. 
recoverability. Yeah? How much data loss can you tolerate and how much can this service provider give you uh, with the solution? Yeah? Scalability, how many requests, tasks, operations per certain time frame do you need as a bare, bare minimum? Yeah? And can they give that to you? Uh, and is this needed around the clock or is this just needed at peak time? You have the thing is. And again, cloud gives you options. Yeah? You are a company that does lunch orders. You spin up the systems at 11 a.m., you spin them down at 1 p.m. Yeah? In the time in between, you have a single server. The rest of the time, you run a whole farm. Latency, how fast does a single operation have to happen? It's often in cloud environments that latency is not as good as it was in your data center. Why? Because in your data center, all machines were probably three feet apart from each other. In the, in the cloud, even if you're going to the same cloud provider into the same region, that might still be 10, five miles between them. And that's suddenly slower. And if you do one request, it doesn't matter. But for example, if your software is written badly and to process a thousand orders, it has to go a thousand times back and forth. And instead of a microsecond that suddenly takes one second, half an hour is over before your order is processed. Yeah? So this is things you have to ensure that you understand what you will get for your money and what you need. And of course, we all want a 100% available system that runs at infinite speed with zero latency and never loses data. But unless you were born yesterday and you started your job like this morning, you understand that's not real. Yeah? There will always go something wrong. Yeah? Elasticity, I already talked about it. Things get up and down. I only need it once a month, all these things. Yeah? Another one is retention. I work for an industry, we have to keep records for seven years. Most default systems in clouds only give you like 30 days of retention. Because for a normal human being, that's way enough for most industries. Yeah? A pizza shop doesn't need to know who ordered the pizza six years ago. Yeah? That, that's irrelevant. Yeah? Uh, if you trade on the stock market and you made a mistake, someone might come after you for seven years. Yeah? So the thing is, other requirements. Predictable performance. That's M1. If something runs, it has to run in exactly that time frame. Yeah? That is very hard to do on-prem with physical hardware. It's almost impossible to do it in your own data center in virtual environments. It's absolutely impossible to do it in the cloud because you have no control over it. So if this is a requirement, that will push you in the better not category, I guess. Yeah. Um, the other one is security. And this is where I have very mixed feelings. At the very beginning of the cloud time, everybody was like, security, ah, cloud, blah, 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 yeah? No. All the major cloud providers today go through rigorous audits and everything. They cannot risk things, yeah? Um, and I can explain that with a very simple story I heard a couple of days ago from someone that told me about his uh, tax advisor. His tax advisor says, we cannot cheat on taxes. Why? You are a small guy. It wouldn't matter. But if you get audited or caught, I cannot mess with your tax records. Because if you get audited, all my other clients get audited. So I cannot even risk for the small guy that doesn't care and doesn't matter in the big picture. Even for that guy, I have to provide the best possible service. Yeah? So, and security is really hard to implement correctly. So I'm not sure that you can do it better on-prem than the cloud can do it for you. Yeah? And again, if you have 300 top IT people in your company working for, different story. But honestly, who has that? Yeah? You have probably five, six clever guys, and, but they are focusing on the core business. Secure, unless you are a security agency, security is not your core business. Security is something you have to provide. And this is where the cloud comes in. Yeah? And that could be helpful there. Yeah? So the next one um, is you have to understand the limits of your infrastructure and the limits of the cloud. Because a lot of times, and now we're focusing on the technical part of can you move it there or not. Yeah? And this is especially 
This doesn't mean for new stuff. Yeah? All the new stuff, when you develop it now, you can already write it in a way that it can scale out, shard the data, all this awesomeness you can do today. Yeah? Um, but for the majority of people that I know and that work in, in professional IT, they have to deal with 30, 40 years of legacy. Yeah? And 30 years ago, nobody thought about sharding because who has a second server in the data center? So everything was running on the same box. Yeah? I have, we have more linked servers in our databases than we have employees. Yeah? It's one of the, yeah? and I've seen queries that go in circles between servers. Yeah? And this is just why? Because 30 years of development happened and changes and someone, nobody paid attention for a while and it's there. And it's not going to go away tomorrow because we, we just finished a project that every application has to provide an application ID when logging into SQL Server. And we needed more than 10,000 IDs. That means there's 10,000 pieces of software out there. Uh, that's not going to go away. If I assign every IT employee, one of them, and they can move it in one month into the cloud perfectly, it's still not happening in this decade or the next decade to be finished. Yeah? So you need to know your infrastructure, how fast it is, how it works, and how fast you can go on it. And this is just some stock pictures when you apply limits. <laughs> That's what shows up on Google. Uh, so the problem with infrastructure when you read the pamphlets, and this goes for your favorite hardware vendor, same as for your favorite cloud provider and for your favorite software provider. There's a technologist that creates the feature and then it hands over that documentation to someone that works in a department called marketing. And they are really good with the English language or any other language they speak. And they will twist the words of the technician so that you think you are buying the best thing in the world. Yeah? And what I learned over the years is you cannot take anything you read by face value. And this is where the apples and oranges comparison comes in more and more because you have on, everybody presents it different. They sell it per transaction, they sell it per, per minute, they sell it per month. Here you get a discount when you stay longer, here, stay, here you get a discount when you go bigger and it's impossible to compare. And that's not even for the price, that's just the technology. Yeah? These guys scale in uh, one, three, five, seven. These guys scale two, four, eight, sixteen. 16. Uh, you don't know. In this case, when the CPUs go up, the memory goes up with it. In the other case, the memory doesn't go up. In this third provider, just the memory goes up. And you have no freaking way to ever compare this by just looking at two numbers. Yeah? And they all, I guess they, the, one company specifies which CPU they're using, the other one says it's something like this, and the third one says nothing at all. Uh, one, when they talk about cores, they mean actual cores, the other one means a virtual core, which is either a core or a hyperthread. You never know, yeah? and that makes it really hard. Also, they all publish benchmarks. My favorite topic, and one of my best friends does this for a living. He's literally the person that publishes these nice little results on TPC org uh, when there's a new benchmark, official benchmark test. Yeah? And we spend many, many beers talking about it, and it's hilarious what he does to re achieve these results. You can never do this in production. Yeah? My favorite case is the old TPCC benchmarks. They were required in a two-hour test to only have three checkpoints. But the data could never be older than 45 minutes. So what they did is they get two checkpoints out of the way immediately and then waited an hour and a half to issue the last one to finish exactly when the test finishes. So they had the majority in the middle when the test runs the fastest and disrupted by checkpoints. At the end of the test, they have to literally pull out the power plug and then plug it back in, and then have the database recover. And they did that test on a 256 core machine, and it took a week and a half to recover. 
they passed the test and published an awesome TPCC benchmark result. Could you ever do this in production? No. There's no way. So whenever you read a benchmark, I have a saying, this is horribly translated from the German language, but it goes about like this. Never trust the statistics you haven't forged yourself. Yeah, uh, it makes much more sense in German, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, you have to be very careful with this, yeah? Not, I understand not everybody has a test lab where they can rerun results and compare them themselves, but do some basic testing. You, you know what you're managing all day, and when you ask, hey, can we move this up here? You can say, yes, but I need to test it first, yeah? Move it up there, have a couple of nice users that are willing to test something and get their results, or you know your maintenance routine, get the database up there, do all the index rebuilds. It took you three hours on-prem, it takes you three hours in the cloud, eh, good chance these things are equal. Yeah? It took you three hours on-prem, it takes you three days in the cloud, or, or, yeah? or the other way around. Ten minutes here, one minute in the cloud. Oh, surprise, good. So, this thing is, yeah? You also have to read the fine print because there's always a but. Yeah? Amazon is really good when you Google whatever feature or whatever product you want and the word limits. And then you get a PDF or a website that has 50 pages of what the actual limits are. <laughs> yeah? uh, I'm pretty sure Microsoft publishes them somewhere else. Yeah? But it's, thing is, yeah? My favorite example, and that's, AWS, as of a month ago, when I had to upload the slides. <laughs> Today, that is not true anymore. <laughs> I'm just saying that. If anybody from AWS is in the room, yes, I know it. That's no longer true. A month ago, it was. <laughs> yeah? So a month ago, you had a 500 megabyte per second limit per hard drive that you attach to a VM. Okay, that's a limit. That's interesting. The hard drive might be slower, but the maximum theoretical when you bought the best SSDs and everything, that was the, the maximum you can do per disk. And you can have 26 disks on a VM. Great. So basic elementary school math gives me I can have 13 gigabytes per second. Yeah, but then you load that one other document <laughs> and scroll around for a while, and then you read, oh, there's a top limit for storage for 1,250 megabytes per VM. And this is the part that changed. They now have certain very expensive VMs that don't have that limit anymore. The majority still has, but there's now exceptions where this limit is no longer there, um, where the limit is actually 13,000. Guess what? They learned the lesson. Uh, thing is, so that's actually not the speed. It's 1250. Doesn't matter if you're 26 drives or just three of them you will get the same speed. Yeah? Uh, and this is where, where it's so hard to compare this. Yeah? And I'm just giving everybody this. Yeah? I get it. And if you call them, they're all positive because it's their product. It's what they sell. That's what pays their paycheck. You have to look at it a little bit uh, careful. Yeah? Technical decision factors. So we have the apples and the oranges, and we have to compare them. As we already talked, it is not that easy. <laughs> Because sometimes what we need is this. <laughs> it's half an apple, half an orange. Sometimes it could be this. Uh, an apple that's an orange on the inside. Uh, or this is what's called marketing. <laughs> uh, no, it, it's, it's, it's just hard. Yeah? Um, and this is... The main dimensions you have to compare when you compare your own hardware, your own virtual machines with the cloud, you have to look at compute, you have to look at network, and you have to look at storage. And you always have to look at all three. If you just look at one, something will go wrong. Yeah? Compute is CPU, clock speeds, cores, instruction set. An old CPU works very different than a new CPU. Yeah? Can be the new one can be slower, but can be faster because it has instructions that help your workload. So it's, it's a nightmare. Yeah? Uh, cache, size and speed, memory, speed of memory, very different. Yeah? A server, they crawl because they have very cheap memory chips in them that are very slow. Other ones are fast. 
my guess in the cloud, everything is about money, so there's going to be most likely the cheap stuff in there. So even if you have a gigabyte here and a gigabyte here, one might be 20% or 30% slower than the other one, which in a database application like SQL Server immediately translates to 30% less performance because all a database does is move data in and out of memory. Yeah? Very little things happen inside the CPU. Network, latency, big issue thing is. In many cases, it might not matter. But if it matters, it's very thing. The other one, throughput. Very careful. You read, oh, this VM has up to 10 gigabits per second. But then you read, oh, I'm only getting an eighth of the VM of the box for me. So I still have the 10 gigabits? No, you have exactly one eighth of it. Um, and in the early days of cloud computing, a lot of these things was shared on nice behavior. These days, I tried. I, I got an eighth of a computer. You cannot go one bit per second faster than they allow you. Yeah? This is perfectly shaped now. You cannot influence the workload of your neighbor, which is great, which means I have an, an, an expectable performance. But it's also bad that, hey, sometimes I could run faster, but that's gone. That's sad. <laughs> Storage. That's the most nightmare because there's more different storage types than probably people in this room. Um, and capacity is one thing. That's usually what it's charged for. But then, of course, there's latency again. And we all know that SQL Server, especially when it comes to the transaction log, is very sensitive. Yeah? And there were very big complaints in the early days in, in certain Seattle-based cloud providers that were here 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> to not name Microsoft. Uh, they brought out a new product, but it was horrible on writing to databases. Yeah, everything else worked great. Thing is, they fixed it. They came up with a solution. Three months later, problem is gone. Yeah, so yes, thing is, and of course the throughput, how much is there? Yeah, and then features. Do you need snapshotting? Do you need to clone stuff? Do you need deduplication? Do you need compression on your storage system to make things happen? Uh, for example, I run a development environment that uses about 300 terabytes of actual storage but provides 10 petabytes to the developers because they all get the same data. I just make copies and copies and copies on it on a storage system. So a storage system with features makes sense. Great. So we thought about can we move development to the cloud? And we suddenly figured out we have to pay 10 petabytes of storage there because the cloud provider does the deduplication under the hood, but charges us for each copy the same price. Okay. Six months later, a third party offers a service in the cloud that lets us put the data once, but get it 10 times out deduplicated. Different story. We're still not using it because they are too expensive, but maybe six months down the road, they get reasonable, and then we can use it. So. It's a very fast-paced changing system, and just because the solution is not there today doesn't mean it's not there tomorrow. Yeah? And you have to look at these. So, the next couple of slides I will skip over very quickly because they are designed to be your homework or more like checklists. Because the previous slide basically summed it up. This is where I put together what are the limits today, from when you look at. Your physical boxes, your VM. Can I do this? Yep. So your physical boxes, your VM at home, AWS or Azure. Where are the limits? Yeah. So for CPUs, you can have one to eight CPUs with a bunch of cores in it, uh, and this gives you between four and four hundred forty-eight threads in. Uh, the VM world, you have between 1 and 128, AWS also 448 virtual CPUs. Yeah? So these are limits. And this is, I'm spending a little bit of time on this slide because they're all built the same way. Yeah? The same with cache. You have on-prem, you have actual control over cache. Once you're in the virtual world, it's shared through the hypervisor and you have zero control over how the cache is used. Yeah? Thing is, same goes for memory. I did the same slides for memory. Um, for the network. And again, this is what's intended to be uh, used and discussed 
at home. Uh, and storage capability is thing is, there's one fun fact. I've actually figured out how big can SQL Server become. Uh, so you can have 524 petabytes in the database. Uh, you can have theoretically 32,767 instances, uh, databases on a single instance, and you can install 50 instances supported on a single server, and that gives you 818 zettabytes of storage on a single server. Physically, that's not possible, and uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because that example came from a YouTube video that I watched where a physicist explains why it's not possible. To make that possible, you have to make the storage so dense to put it all in one box that it would be so dense that it would become a black hole and swallow itself. <laughs> uh, so, okay. <laughs> that will not work. <laughs> um, but it, it's interesting. Um, but again, and with storage, I want to spend a little bit of time at least there. The cloud has infinite capacity, so they claim. Infinite is a very big number, so they don't have that much, but they have a lot. Usually way more than you have at home or in your data center. But the way the cloud is designed is they have it in small portions. So if you need 100 terabytes in one piece, that's a big of a challenge for the cloud. So that's another thing you have to consider when you move, make a decision. Do I have something that's scaled up because it grew over the years and that's what I have to deal with? Uh, or is it something that I can spread over 10 small machines? Yeah, um, it's, it was a thing is, are they getting bigger and bigger in the cloud? Yes. When Microsoft first asked me to have a look at Azure SQL database, the limit for the database was one gigabyte. So we thought about it. Why not? I mean, looks like a good idea. We don't have to deal in our own data center. That's back then, like 12, 13 years ago. That, that never went public, by the way. Yeah? So not, not, when, when they went public, it was 10 gigabytes. <laughs> so the one gigabyte limit, we, we thought about it. We looked at our database. At that time, we had an OLTP database of 15 terabyte size. Yeah? So we looked at it, can we shard it in any way so we can like, get 1,000 of these databases or 15,000 and run it there? Why not? Simple. At the time, it was a good idea. And then we found out we actually have a single customer in the database that would not fit in the one gigabyte. <laughs> yeah. So that's what you have to check. Yeah. Uh, today, yeah, what did they show? 100 terabytes would be a different story. Yeah. Again, how you can compare all this, this is for at home, I guess the thing is. And if you're unclear there, you have a question, my email address is in the deck. Shoot me an email, I'll help you decipher the mumbo jumbo of marketing language around what's there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, storage IOPS. That's also another one is, I hate the term IOPS. It has no meaning whatsoever. Every time a storage vendor comes to me and wants to sell me something, says, we can do 100,000 IOPS. And I'm like, I bet you 10 million it doesn't. Unfortunately, nobody was actually had ever the guts to take that bet, because I would want it easily. In SQL Server, the smallest IO that SQL Server will ever do is 512 bytes. And that's only on a rotating spindle for a log write of a single record. If you run that same write on an SSD, it will already be 4,096 bytes. Because the smallest write that a SQL Server can do is one, IO, is one block size, which on rotating spindles was 512 bytes, on SSDs is 4,096 bytes. Yeah, that's the smallest one. But that's a very rare, rare, rare occasion. That happens probably 10 times a day on a SQL Server. Yeah. More likely, it's 8 kilobytes at a time, 60 kilobytes, 64, 256, or up to 4 megabytes. When you know how to use the backup command and you specify buffer sizes and all this, you're suddenly at 4 megabytes I.O. And every time a storage vendor tells me they can do 300,000 IOPS, I just run a backup <laughs> with 4 megabyte I.O. size. 
Nobody can do that, uh, and not for a long time. Yeah, the problem with IOPS is they never specify how big the IO is, and of course, it's it. A fifth grader can figure out that an IOPS for a megabyte will take longer than for a kilobyte. Pretty much, it's not a thousand times longer, but it is longer. Yeah, so just IOPS has no meaning unless you specify the size. And that's, the, that's one of the other pitfalls when you just compare based on marketing material. Yeah? Storage throughput, same thing. Uh, just to example, today's hardware that you can buy without breaking the limit of your credit card uh, is 280,000 megabytes per second. That's the maximum speed I can do a table scan on SQL Server on hardware I can buy today. Yeah, on-prem. Nobody needs that. <laughs> yeah, uh, And the only reason I know I can do it is because I found a hardware vendor that was nice enough to do the test with me. Practically, we never even bought one of these machines yet. Two years from now, maybe, not today. Yeah? So that's the limit today. But on a SAN, for example, practically it's about 16,000 megabytes per second. Very big difference. Yeah. Um, in Azure, about 2,000 per megabyte per VM, not bad. Uh, and on-prem on a VM, you probably could not do 16,000 in any form. Yeah? Uh, AWS, the 1250, no longer true, it's now 13,000. And also Azure has faster ones where they give you local things. Yeah? And again, all these things are from about a month ago. I had to upload the slides and I have to present with them. Uh, it's in my contract, so I can't give you today's data. And both Azure and AWS have direct attached storage, but it's not durable. So when you shut off your VM, the data goes away. But for things like TempTB or so, you can have faster things. Same with storage latency. When I started, 30 milliseconds were considered an ultra-fast hard drive. Nowadays, we start measuring storage performance in microseconds. That's the usual. And we have the first devices where we actually compare nano and nanoseconds, because we uh, it, it's where it goes. Yeah? So there's a big way, I think it's, yeah? In the cloud, where they always separate storage from the device, you will still be in the millisecond range. Yeah? And again, for most workloads, that's not a problem. Yeah? If you have an edge case workload where it's a problem, that might be the reason why you can't use it. Yeah? You might be able to solve the problem by re-engineering the whole thing and using a different technology in the cloud. But if you just stick with lift and shift SQL Server, that's not where you can go. A log write with 512 bytes that takes a millisecond is bad. A four megabyte backup at the same speed, great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that it always depends what you need. Yeah. So good. So to summarize the whole thing of hardware that we talked about, this is the range of hardware. And yes, unfortunately, I'm from Europe, so I work in centimeters and not in inches, but <laughs> thing is, yeah. So that's the scale of what's available at hardware. Yeah. Down here is really bad. Up there is really good hardware. Yeah. And the cloud is somewhere. Let's put it roughly in the middle, a little bit below average. Yeah. And that's the thing is. The big difference is, is like. Are you down here? Or are you up here? <laughs> yeah. If you right now have great hardware and you're happy with it, going to the cloud might give you some grief. Yeah. If you have shitty crap stuff from 20 years ago that's still running, uh, oh, you will be happy. The cloud is going to be great for you. Because the thing is, and the cloud will take care of you. They will going to replace the stuff for you constantly because you keep paying them. The reason you have 10-year-old hardware is because your company stopped paying your department to get new ones. Or they just gave you the money to buy new ones, but you still needed the old ones because 
then you've got new work to do with it. Yeah? In the cloud, that's now the other problem. And this could be, and I'm not joking here, one of the main reasons you might want to go to the cloud because now your boss has to pay for it versus in-house you can say, no, let's buy it next month. In the cloud, you can buy it next month, but then it's not running till next month. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because they just turn it off. And if you don't make it faster or pay more, it doesn't go faster. Yeah, So it might make your day-to-day -day life easier. On the other hand, you know you're going to probably spend more money there. So it's it's a two-sided thing. Is, yeah. Um, so you will be smiling when, when you have bad things, when you have good things, you will be less happy. Uh, my hardware is at the very top, so that's my emotion uh, when I try it. But again, I work for a very, very small edge case scenarios. I, I always find them. I only work for them. That's why I exist. But uh, that's the case. So let's get me out of the equation. And it is. And I think this is the best way I could explain it to everybody. Yeah? Many cases where you will, it will be awesome and among cases where it will be a very bad experience. Yeah? You will meet, because the job of the cloud is not to give you the best available hardware. No, it gives you something that most people can use successfully in the middle. Yeah? And for the smiley face part, it could be, yeah, you had the smiley face part, but you actually had too much hardware. You got too much, and it's actually not necessary to do the job. You just had more. Yeah? It's a rare condition, but I know people that just work in companies where money is not an issue. They exist. Um, and they could use the little more thing is. So, recommendation without considering money. That goes first. So, money is not an issue. <laughs> Um, workload is small, medium, it can be partitioned or scaled out. If you fall into that category, thing is, you have execution time can vary, it's not that important. If it takes five minutes today, if it takes 10 minutes tomorrow, all that is fine. It's another thing. If your compared cloud infrastructure is better than what you have, in-house, when you try to do the apples and oranges, compare as, as good as you can. If what you can buy in the cloud is better than what you have in-house. Or you have a team that just can't handle infrastructure. And that's a very common case. That your sysadmin team is just not good at it. It takes them three months to spin up a new server. In the company I work for, when we order a server, we type a couple of lines in our configuration database, which then funnily creates the order. <laughs> so, because I don't want to write emails. So it created the email to create the order. The vendor sends me back the machine. About three weeks later, it comes to the data center. The data center guy has one of these little barcode thingies, reads the serial number on the machine, reads a barcode on the network cable that's already in the, the rack, reads that number, plugs it in, plugs the power in, turns it on, and the machine automatically installs itself to whatever is configured in the CMDB, and about 30 minutes later, we can use it in production. I then usually run it two or three days through testing, but it's ready to go. Yeah? Um, and it took us three years to get there. Not three years working all day on it, but slowly, piece by piece, improving the process. Yeah? In this case, that's not. Yeah? But I know when I joined the company, I'm like, oh, yeah, we need a new VM. Come back in two months. We have it ready for you. That should be press a button and get it. Yeah? And not insert your credit card number, press a button. Same thing. Yeah? So cloud providers solve the problem you, you, if you can't manage your own hardware. Yeah? That's fully acceptable, that has a price tag. And honestly, if you have that in your company, that will be a part that the cloud will probably replace completely. Because thing is, yeah. Another one, short-term project. Yeah. If you have a short-term project, all these things are great for the cloud. In all other cases, it depends. <laughs> 
Yeah, I put one data center logo here uh, to <laughs> thing is yeah. So uh, yes, other factors to consider. Yeah, uh, very simple: people, money, time, uh, birds, and puzzles. Uh, no, just more funny pictures from the internet. <laughs> It's people, money, and time. Uh, the other two, it was empty down there, so I needed to put something there. Uh, <laughs> yeah? Your C-level manager says, you must do it. <laughs> Either way, we stay on-prem, we go to the cloud, there's a director from up there, you can object, but in the end, you say yes, but, not no. Yeah, that's the, the only option you normally have there. Yeah? Uh, regulations. Certain things the cloud cannot give you, yeah? Less and less, because of course, Microsoft and AWS go through the certification process for every regulation on the planet, so they take that burden off you, yeah? But there's still some things uh, that you might uh, not get in the cloud. So for example, I worked for healthcare industry, for pharmaceutical industry, they need to keep 30 years of records, yeah? Uh, if you know that you have to pay for 30 years in the cloud, month for month for the same storage, uh, that's a very different math than when you know you needed three months and then you can destroy it. Um, yeah. The law, data must be stored in a certain place. Yeah. Uh, again, most cloud providers solved the problem. Yeah. So three years ago, that was an issue. Today, if you store your data in any of the big clouds, they take care of the problem that you have stored it correctly because they have agreements with the governments with whatever that deal with that problem. Yeah, great. But there might be other laws that prevent you from doing something. Yeah, so just these are the ones. Time. How much time do we have to fix this? We can do it in house for ten million dollars, or we can do it for fifteen million dollars in the cloud. In house, it will take us six months. In the cloud, we can have it next week. That might be worth five million that you beat your competitor by six months. Yeah. So considerations both ways. Elasticity. We can turn it on and off all the time. That's the biggest plus in the cloud. If you can do this, the, the, the scales tip massively towards a cloud solution if you have elastic workload. That's just partially of the year or not. Yeah. And of course, how much money it will cost. Yeah. Uh, and so, the part everybody is waiting for, and we have about seven minutes to do, uh, is how do you compare cost? And when it comes to comparing cost, it's no longer apples and oranges, it's now apples and panders, because that's how different and hidden gems are everywhere. Yeah? And I will probably have to disappoint you, this will now not be a seven minute talk on how to read the price lists there, it's more like, what do you have to look for? Yeah. So option number one is you have a constant workload. So how does the cost on-prem compare to when you are in the cloud? Yeah. So on-prem versus cloud, red versus purple. I hope you can see that colors on the things. It's very hard. The slides had to come in these colors. On-prem, you have to buy the stuff and then you have to operate it. You have to buy it, build it, and operate it. In the cloud, you just deploy it and run it. Yeah? So very different this. You have on-prem, you have to invest upfront and then operate it, which both cost money. In the cloud, you just pay as you go. And this is marketing 101 from every cloud provider. So how does this look in a diagram over time? So we have time, no specific time frame because I'm not gonna put my finger anywhere near actually mentioning any numbers <laughs> in public. <laughs> and then we have cost on the other side. In the cloud, it's a straight line up at the beginning. You have a certain amount of workload, you spend that much, and every month you pay the same amount. That means it goes up in a straight line because in the first month you paid a dollar, in the next month you pay a dollar, that means you now pay two dollars. Uh, next month you pay another dollar, you are up at three dollars, and so on. So it's a straight line up uh, in a certain angle. I choose 45 degrees because it's easy to draw in PowerPoint. Yeah? Uh, that's not to scale here. Yeah? 
And then at a certain point in time, the cloud provider will change the pricing model and you hopefully pay less. And I have a lot of bets running that this curve will tilt the other way. That's where my money is. My guess is once they have all locked you in, the prices will go up. We've all seen it, it's called cable TV bills. <laughs> Same thing, <laughs> same thing. You could make your own movies and theater productions at home. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, a, that's the curve, yeah? And the other one is usually cloud providers want to pay them a lot of money to give you a discount, yeah? And then you complain to them, they give you more discount, so. But it's basically a lineup and you keep paying, yeah? Which is great because when you start your business, you didn't spend much. And over time, you pile it up and you hopefully make more money than you pay. Great. When you do it yourself, you see this straight up red line because you have to lay down a lot of money. Yeah? But once you laid it down, your operating costs are much lower. And this is, I'm speaking just from the infrastructure. Because the first argument, every cloud provider, okay, but we give you so many services on top of it. Thank you very much, five minutes. Um, but we give you so many services on top. Yeah, 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 but if you're honest and you already have an IT team and you're going to the cloud and you have 10 people now, you will probably staff down to nine or keep all 10. So that's not gonna change in your bill. Yeah, so you still need, because the cloud is not doing things for you automatically unless you buy the whole software there, yeah? But normally you still then need someone that spins up the VM, deploys it, still writes the code, manages, figures out why it's not running, restores after someone deleted stuff by accident. That's not gonna go away. Your DBA is not gonna go away. The only difference is instead of yelling at the sysadmin, he's gonna yell at the call center guy from the cloud provider, yeah? But the yelling still needs to be done, yeah? So that's not gonna go away. The one thing that's different is, so, over time, that one line keeps growing this way, the other line keeps growing this way. And this is, comes back to the very first slide. The more stuff you have, the less interesting the cloud's gonna be. Because you have that one-time investment, you build the building, uh, you build a server room, you build a network infrastructure, you build firewalls around it, yeah? Uh, you cabled it, you did all that. That's all the investment that happens in week one, and then is. And this is why I didn't put a time frame on it. This diagram is true for ten, five years as it is true for three weeks, wh whatever you wanna look at at the time frame, yeah? And it's very clear. This is the range where the cloud is absolutely makes sense. So you have a three-year project, you figure out, the write-off time for your data center build is gonna be 10 years. Cloud makes total sense. You already have paid for the data center and you, know, you just put in a couple of new servers. That diagram will shift where the lines are and then there's a new intersection point and you will have to figure out make, does it make sense or not. And the on-prem is somewhere in the other wing. And then there's the nasty piece in the middle where I would recommend my solution, it's called Bitcoin. It's sold for 50 cents at various hardware stores. It has a Bitcoin symbol on the one side and the computer chip on the other side. You flip it and you make a decision. Uh, <laughs> heads or tails in the old days, now it's Bitcoins. <laughs> no heads. I guess, yeah? So this is this. And then there's one more thing where this can make a difference. This is this line. This is when elastic workloads come in. So that line in the cloud suddenly tilts down match and match. And as you can see, I picked one where it's really far over now the intersection point. And if you can turn it off a little bit more often, it might actually never hit. So that there is very clear ones where it will never hit. And especially if this goes up for like very high because we're talking about one server where you have to spend $100,000 to build a data center and then put a $5,000 server in it. There's no point in doing this ever. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Click, 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 quickly. <laughs> this is what happens, yes. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I will not share. 
<laughs> I will not share the payment I received for here, which is zero, uh, with you for doing the work. So, no, exactly. If you have growing workload, if you need to refresh your infrastructure, you have that. Yeah? But also, if you grow in the cloud, you pay more faster, and that becomes a different curve. Yeah? And it goes on and it goes on, and with Elastic, you defer it. Yeah? Um, the tip I'm giving you, and I have like 10 seconds left, um, is try to separate the certain different areas. Yeah? Compare your people costs separate from your hard, the hardware or VM cost, separate from licensing cost, separate from management overhead, all this, because then it's much, much easier to compare. Because you will never find two equal things. But if you slice it in multiple slices, you, you remember the apple with the orange intermixed? If you compare slice by slice, it's much easier than uh, trying to look at the whole thing in one go. Yeah? What I normally do is, as an example, is I take, like, on, on AWS, it's super easy. It's same on, on Azure. Yeah? I pick a VM, and then I once get the price on Linux, and then I get the price on SQL Server Enterprise Edition or SQL Server Standard Edition. And then I take the difference between the two, and that's my licensing cost. That's how much they charge me for licensing, if I just take the pure VM. So now I can compare how much do I pay for licensing versus how much I pay for the hardware. Yeah? And these are the, the little tricks uh, over time. So, yeah. So, Thank you for listening to me on a Friday afternoon after this long conference. I hope this was helpful. I have to clear the stage because someone else wants to come in and talk to you or other people. But I will be happy to answer any questions in the hallway. Uh, and yeah, thank you.